podcasting from Chico, California, tucked in between some of Northern California's best freshwater fisheries. This is the Barbless Podcast, a podcast about NorCal fly fishing, guiding, fisheries management, and sustainability. If you have ideas or any questions for the show, leave the guys a voice message on the Barbless Podcast hotline, area code 530-636-2523. Also check out http colon slash slash podcast.barbless.co, where you can download past episodes and show notes. Be sure to follow them on Instagram at barbless.co and connect with them on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash barbless.co. Here's your hosts, Chad Alderson and Nick Hanna. Fish on. Hey, welcome everybody to another episode of the Barbless Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Hanna, here with Uthrin, son of Uthrin, Chad Alderson. Chad, how's it going? Good, good. Have you been fishing lately? Yeah, uh, I did the North Fork for opener above Chester. Nice. And it was like, it reminded me of Apocalypse Now when there's that that scene where all the helicopters are going into that LZ and it's like sun up and there's like from left to right, there's probably like 20 Hueys with about 100 guys in each Huey coming in and it's very similar. There were just so many anglers down there and it was <laughs> it was getting beat up, but I imagine scra- I got a few. Nice, nice. Well, we have an um, awesome guest here today. Um, it was funny. I, I gave him a call to kind of talk over what we're going to what we're gonna do in the show, and he said that we had met before. We'll tell that story here in a, in a second. But um, Roger Bloom with uh, Fish and Wildlife, he's the Inland Fisheries Program Manager. Roger, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having hey, me. Thanks for driving up yeah, to Chico. Yeah, thanks for Out coming. of Sacramento? Correct. Yeah, yeah. long drive. Yeah. yeah. Not too bad, though. We got him a, we got him a surprise in the fridge. Uh-oh. I don't want to give away what the surprise is. But <laughs> probably figured it out. How about you, Roger? You've been uh, you've been fishing lately. You know, I, I'm pretty busy with family, kids, and work. But I did yeah, scratch yeah. out. The department has a bass tournament. Oh, um, cool! That oh, we cool. put on at Shasta. Okay. So we try to beat each other up pretty bad and have the honors of how many fish you know who has the biggest stringer kind of thing, the biggest weight. So I did that a couple weeks ago. How was how was the fishing? Oh, it's great. Those spotted yeah. bass are easy. And, you know, yeah. Not huge fish, but... Um, yeah. And then I've been trying to get out on the... You know, the American, I live right on the river, and oh, so okay. the shad are, are... The shad are running. Yep. Yeah. They've been running for a while. Yeah. Just, uh, I need to get the boat out, but it's just time stuff, so, but... Do you um, get on... And so, is that your main fishery, kind of hitting the, the American? And, yeah. Yeah. I I've, I kind of grew up on the banks there. Oh, fishing, cool. Fishing steelhead, so I'm a steelhead junkie. Um, Love it. And so, yeah, I tried to get out there during that time, but also, I mean, like right now, for striped bass and chat is another thing that I love doing, so... Nice. Cool. Well, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us, um, you know, how you got into the the fisheries uh, world and, um, you know, just where you're, where you're from and what got you into fishing. Sure. Yeah. I mean, kind of going back to the American, um, grew up there chasing fish, uh, went to high school in Sacramento and knew that uh, I wanted to do something in regards to fishing. Yeah. So I talked to my teachers there and believe it or not, uh, Bill Keeney, I knew him before he even started his shop. Oh, cool. And, and, uh, between he and my teachers are like, don't become a fishing guide. <laughs> and I don't know if that's because of my, my lack of fishing prowess at the time, or they're like, you're, you're a science geek, man. So why don't you just go that route? And so I asked them where, you know, how do I do that? What should I do? And they said, yeah, you need to, you know, go to college, get a degree. That's your only chance at that. So, right. and they pointed me towards Humboldt. So I eventually Perfect. went to Humboldt, studied nice. wildlife and fisheries there. And is that where your, uh, passion for steelhead started? No, it st- started on the American, gut, but got refined in Humboldt. Yeah, yeah on yeah, the nice. on the mad for sure. Um, cool. So yeah, and then just springboarded from from college uh, into working for the department uh, on the wild trout program at the time. So is that nineties, kind of mid nineties when yeah, you started? Early nineties, yeah, yeah. So oh, nice. Yeah. So you saw a lot of cool stuff from all that water that we received in California in the the later nineties and through this late drought that we just experienced. So you've, you've seen, a, seen a lot, a See, lot of up and downs. Yeah, I've seen a lot of changes. Um, I was lucky enough to be single at the time and be in the field, putting <laughs> 280 days of fishing, oh, you know, uh, doing work across the state on the wild trout and then fish after work. So I was that super blessed amazing. and lucky to be able to, you know, have that experience and 
figure out where fish are from snorkeling and electric fishing, yeah. all those little techniques we use. So. Well, that's how we, we met. So just to go back on that story, we, um, as I called you, you're like, Hey, I think we met before on the banks of the Yuba. And I was like, huh? <laughs> and, uh, th- that year you, we thought it was 2012. I decided to put it with a buddy of mine, put in at Inglebright dam, drop the boat down the pg e road and get in on those headwaters and float it just thinking there would be good fishing up there if and you're listening this isn't a good idea <laughs> you'll see <laughs> why really the fishing wasn't that great but uh we get down to what's called the narrows and um i had to get out and scout this rapid because it it was a lot bigger than what i thought it was going to be and um as i'm doing this you came d- running down the banks to go hey you guys you guys done this before i was like yeah yeah i've done it and so i i need to look at it a little bit and you're like i'm gonna go down and get a picture for you so back yeah, in the, just to have something your mom can remind you remember you by <laughs> but yeah exactly and uh I, I made the mistake of not going to that last rapid i didn't go get a good look at it and uh when we came down into it boat spun me and came in backwards and as you saw um completely flipped us right i mean yeah you, so manny do you have the can you put the video up or the the photo up that's on the screen so, so. what was it like when you from the rocks that you saw when well you're you were looking com- you were looking good at this point right? <laughs> <laughs> he's going backwards down into a bucket and he's looking good that's yeah not, that's i was hoping nice. that you're gonna have a picture of frank flying out of the front of the boat and i i, I got the whole sequence but you guys were so far away from me at that point. And that's a, it was difficult to get to that spot. If you know about the narrows, yeah. I had to do a bunch of rock scrambling just to get to the point to take that picture. Right. Um, and it's probably hard laughing the whole time. I, you know, I didn't, I just kept the, the camera on just clicking away because yeah. I, w- I had a feeling. And then when you guys hit that one little, um, oh, that man. reverse it was a toilet hydro- bowl. Yeah. It reverse was the- hydraulic, you guys flipped. And I was worried about the lean bar because it's a welded lean bar. I'm like, oh, I hope they don't get pinned right and uh I, it was like i was like in a washing machine i was in with my p i had a pdf and my waders on and i was down there for a while my shoulder was dislocated and i was being spun around in the water when i popped up i popped my shoulder back into place i saw an oar i, I grabbed the oar and i grabbed the boat and i get myself into position on the boat upside down you know and uh, i didn't see frank and when I, all of a sudden he pops up on the front of the boat and his eyes were just huge, <laughs> just massive. I'm like, are you okay? He's like, yeah. He's like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah. I was like, all right, we got to kick to the shore. And after, you know, I don't know, 50 yards of rapids, we had to kick with wader boots on all the way to the shore and then flip a heavy, you know, weighted boat back over. And I think they came scrambling down at that point, making sure. We were all right. Yeah, you guys, uh, you guys were in shock for sure. Oh, by the time I got to you, yeah, yeah. That was, there, there was a picture of it on Nick's uh, Instagram, yeah. NorCal Fly Guy. So go check it out. <laughs> We've got it up on the video. If you guys are watching the YouTube video, <laughs> you'll see it. Um, yeah, I'll never forget that day because it I was it was my birthday, and then you your birthday's the same day. That's amazing. What's up? <laughs> and we didn't know that till just, you know, just today. Now. So <laughs> that's, that's pretty, that's crazy. Pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah. I won't be doing that, that one again. No, yeah. I don't, I don't think gnarly. ever. And you lost all your gear, right? Well, we snapped a fly rod. Um, I think we, so you were holding four, we had four fly rods there. I think we ended up with three, but one of them was broken. So, um, yeah, we lost some gear, but. We're, we, we're alive to tell it today. That's what, I guess that's what matters. So, you know what the irony is? Um, when you were on the Yuba with me, um, we didn't go through any rapids and you lost two rods. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. From, from both because I did something, you know, I like fell on one and then one guy caught in the trees and, you know, whatever. That was pretty cool. We just did a, we took the jet boat up there and, um, in super skinny water, but the sturgeon were all over. Oh, all it's all just over blowing the gear. Yeah. They yeah. were just like in two, three, four feet of water sunning and we went over probably 12 or 15 of them. Yeah. It was oh yeah. Really cool. So, really cool uh, just, stand. just as a factoid and, and I'll, hopefully you guys don't mind as I drop these things as we're talking, but no, no, no. you guys hopefully. So we have science going on on the U, but that was why I was out that day with my colleague, but we're continuing to monitor that fishery. And we just got a detection on a green sturgeon, one of the smaller ones 
that was from the Columbia River. Whoa, Whoa. And very cool. Ran all the way up to Holy to smoke. Daguerre. So that's kind of cool that you know that's that, super cool that they go all over the place. So and, they're anatomists you know. then. Yeah, I did yeah. not know that. Okay, I thought they were just freshwater, but yeah. they can. They're like do one both. of the oldest anadromists next to that. That's pretty cool. Lampreys. Yeah, right. and highly yeah. migratory then too. Yeah, I mean we're or still candy. learning a lot about those what fish, but uh, we we knew that's a hot spot right there at Daguerre, and we get a lot of those fish yeah. milling in the spill basin up at the top. But we we never we never thought that we'd see a Columbia green sturgeon up there. We, so. we saw yeah. like five, six, seven foot beasts out there, like oh, big yeah. big fish. And how long does it take in years? What's the growth you know for life history? What's it take to get like six feet long? Six feet, know? and this is just this is going to be a, a, a wag, but um, I'm going to say a six footer is probably right there at fifteen. 20 years. i was 15, gonna say 20 over years. 20 probably yeah so know? then how about a white sturgeon on say the the sacramento well that's what i was thinking. yeah the, that would okay. be a white the greens okay. don't get that big but a okay. white that big would be probably that age and then some of the large ones down lower you know you're talking 30 40 50 so years old how, how did you know it was a columbia fish um so we have great question uh we have an a uh, pit tag array mm-hmm. that goes across lower down just above simpson lane if you know where that yep. spot is yeah um so we have that antenna that goes all the way along the bottom of the river and they had pit tagged that uh, sturgeon in the columbia gotcha so, so i don't i don't follow is there a device on the on the fish then yeah, there's a little okay. tiny. It's the same stuff that they put in cattle, or you would put okay. in your dog to chip your dog. It's like a transponder. Then exactly, and, when, and then a, when it goes over that tag, yep, it gets it the li- signal. It gets and lit the up. Passive, lights it up. The passive. Yeah, it's right? passive integrated transponder. So yep. that's why it's a pit. Okay. You know, pit tag. Yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> that's that's pretty sweet. Did, so, do you, are other fished? Um, monitor like that, like the salmon and the steelhead, and are they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're doing that, and there's a, a a bunch of different agencies and folks that are monitoring using that type of technology, along with the the other acoustic tags and radio tags. But the, on the Yuba, there's a pit tag reader. I think if it's not already there, it's going to be established at Daguerre at those ladders. Okay, so it'll be another because it's an easy spot to put an antenna because it's kind of uh, a, a, a hard structure and a choke point. Yeah. So what? What area were you focusing on when you, you're out of college? You come into this the fish and wildlife. Where, where did you start, and how did you end up where you're at now? You know, I had heard about the wild trout program, and I was a trout junkie at the time, mm-hmm. and I, I wanted to get as close as I could to finding a way to fish, and uh, it seemed like that program <laughs> kind of aligned in that way, and I was really interested in the management aspect of wild trout. So I just hounded um, – at that point, my boss and uh, said, "Well, I can only pay you for two months." I said, "Good, I'm done. I'm, I'm, I, I, that I'll take it." So, from there, I just you know stuck with that. I I did that probably for about seven or eight years, and then went down to Southern California as the wild trout biologist for Southern California. So okay. I was down there uh, managing those fisheries for two or three years, and nice. then I came back to SAC and did a bunch of other things too. Okay, cool. Yeah. So you were a big part of that heritage and trout fishing challenge, right? Yeah, yeah. So nine ninety eight we established the heritage heritage trout program. Uh-huh. The commission did that. And what? It, so what is that? That's kind of a, a a recognition program to highlight our native trout in California. The golden, the red band, and the McLeod. Yeah, there's the, like a, eleven. Um, mm-hmm. those are all, and there's suites like the red band suite, the golden trout complex down South, and mm-hmm. we have some c- three cutthroats. So that was a program with no funding that they in- initiated to highlight because most anglers, you know, weren't aware of how many that we had, the diversity of native trout that we have, which is, I would say on par with any other state in the nation. Mm-hmm. So That's they instituted crazy. that thing. And that was our goal was to highlight. So okay. I'd go to the ISE and I talk to anglers and we'd show them the poster and they go, well, I caught a golden and, or I want to catch a golden and I don't know what that is. And I, so I, right about that time, Wyoming instituted the cut slam. And so I reached out to Ron Remick in Wyoming and said, Hey, you know, how, how's this thing working? And he goes, Oh, it's great. And so I talked to my, uh, at that point, my wife into flying out and doing the cut slam and meeting with those guys and trying to do a program like that in California. So I took a bunch of stuff from them and came up and, and vetted it through a bunch of the folks in the department to come up with the number six because we got 11 and that's too many, right? That'd be really hard, although people do it. So we worked through that and then finally got that program off the ground. So we got you know a certificate and an acknowledgement. What um, year so was that? Yeah, uh, I want to say we probably instituted that in two thousand and four. Yeah, 
somewhere around there. Uh-huh. The commission finally adopted that. I started to do the research and get everything in place. Nothing happens quickly in state, you know, sure. bureaucracy. Mm-hmm. But I want to say I started that in 2000. Mm-hmm. Flew out to Wyoming, did all that stuff, and then uh, it took about two, three years. I didn't even. I mean, I didn't know about it until you know, thanks to Cast Hope and what they do with those mm-hmm. kids and getting them involved. But um, I, you know, they were the ones that kind of introduced me to the whole thing. I, I had no idea. Yeah, and that's, I mean, they're a great advocate. In fact, I ran into those guys in the Upper Truckee one day, and Ryan had the boys out. And oh, I, really? I, and, they, and so I gave an impromptu a little uh, clinic on the history of that oh, cool. cutthroat oh, so restoration. Cool. Yeah, so Ryan was like, you guys don't understand what's going on. This is really cool. <laughs> so he's been really great in taking those those kids out, and that, that's that been a great platform, you know, to, to advocate that native trout stuff. So it's well, been cool. Talk about um, you're, you're bringing up a, just something more specific, and that's the genetics of these fish, mm-hmm. um, and I, I think that's a, a, a big issue that a lot of people think about with the hatchery programs and the wild trout that you're talking about. And um, you know, I feel back in the '60s and '70s, they were just like, "Hey, let's take an eel river steelhead and, and throw it in the feather," or let's. You know, there was a lot of kind of crazy things going on and and it just like almost like a big laboratory that they were just doing all these different. So I don't know, talk, does that fit into the the fisheries genetics piece that you're doing? Yeah. And you kind of gave a good overview of the, the complexity of trying to unravel what has happened in our state in relation to moving fish around and how they, they intergress with one another if they did. And so it's kind of hard to, to, to figure out that mystery uh, because we have stocking records, but it doesn't get at everything. Mm-hmm. So when you're trying to move forward on figuring that out, along with trying to recover, protect, and conserve these fisheries, genetics really come into play. It's a, it's a sure. big deal. And we were spending a lot of money. We were contracting out and, you know— the whole time we were just feeling like we were hobbyists as genesis. We did, you know, we just read this, you know, just give us the results and then we'll try to figure this out as fisheries managers, the best thing to do. And yeah. really in the back of our mind, we're like, we need our own geneticist. We need our yeah, own right. shop. That would be so much you know, more efficient for us to do. And we'd have somebody that could actually articulate that and work with our hatchery staff to make sure that we're not making any more mistakes or moving fish uh, or uh, interbreeding fish unnecessarily, or even, you know, within the same species too, you know, and right. doing the right type of broodstock development. So we tried, I probably took us 12 years to actually get the money, the position and everything to get our own fisheries geneticist and the lab set up. And we just got that. So, wow. So that's, 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 that's pretty great. exciting. Congratulations. That might be a cool person to have on the show to talk to. Yeah. You know? Yeah, so there's no it. shortage of material with this one because we do <laughs> – I mean, now we're inundated and we're having to, uh, like, balance what we can do from, you know, Eagle Lake e- to Eagle the Lake. Golden Trout. I was going to say Eagle Lake, Oh, yeah. man, there's no shortage we, of questions. We and, just had Val on, and, and and I didn't know that, but she was talking about how, you know, a lot of these fish were <laughs> kind of looking alike, and, and it just – I, I didn't even think about Eagle Lake being that a part of that, but more of the hatchery, the salmon, right, and the steelhead that mm-hmm. are obviously a big part of the hatchery program. Um, but pretty cool that that there's you know hatchery up there doing that and cycling through all the genetics and um, figuring it out. It's 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 can, neat. It's neat to can, can we maybe focus on one particular study or area of focus just so we I because I'm having a hard time making a connection in my head around you know, a specific location, say like Eagle Lake, and then the genetic piece of that, like what, what the goals are for management, how is it, you know, basically the practical application of genetics within that fishery, I guess is what I'm asking. Or, and then yeah, the steps just how do you apply to, it to yeah. other fisheries? That one actually is kind of unique because it's limited to just, you know, historically just to that lake and that mm-hmm. watershed. And so we've been functionally supporting that fishery with um, our hatchery operations. So that one is unique, and and we could apply that same technology to other, uh, like our our uh, cutthroat, the pilot point, or uh, pilot peak. That's that's the that's Nevada right, or Fish right. and Wildlife Service. But we have our own independent strain cutthroat okay. that we have a breed stock for, and then we're looking. 
potentially at a walker strain cutthroat. So I'm super excited about that and, and learning lessons from what we do at Eagle Lake and using the right genetics and the right breeding matrices is what we call it. So you're not crossing brother and sister, you know, because that's not good. Yeah. Um, so, you know, learning from our experiences, using the genetics to track families is, is what we're, we're hoping to do through that process. And then expanding out potentially for our cutthroat populations where it's not just limited, that's a pretty pretty big range as opposed to Eagle Lake, um, which is almost exclusively supported by our hatchery because Pine Creek is loaded mm-hmm. with brook trout, which is another project altogether. But um, As an invasive species? Yeah. So our, our long-term goal is to deal with that and then allow for those Eagle Lakes to repopulate Pine Creek and, and uh, reproduce on their own. That's that's that I want to see. That's a legacy project for me and for the department. And we're making huge strides moving forward on, on trying to make that happen. So Val, Val was saying the water into Eagle Lake was kind of an issue in terms of the flow regi- regimen. Did I say that right? Regime regimen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it, I know. I mean, there's going to be a dependency on, on that as well. Yeah. To have consistent flows in there and habitat up there for spawn and all that. Yeah. And, and, and that's cool that you guys had, had her on. She's, she's got, a, she's a wealth of knowledge when it comes to Eagle yeah. Lake and, and she's spot on Pine Creek in, in most years, uh, doesn't connect year round. In fact, it dries right. up and right. a considerable portion of that lower section, but it does retain water. That's why the brook trout are there way higher up. So I think historically eagles always suffered through boom and bust. Mm-hmm. That's why there's not Lahontan cutthroat there is because they probably blinked out. There's a bunch of other mm-hmm. Lahontan fish there like Tui Chub, which that's what makes the eagles oh, get big. And probably sense. Pied Sculpin because they made through a probably significant drought episode okay. and then got invaded by um, likely a, a rainbow from either the pit or the feather, feather You're drainage. You're talking about thousands of years. Yeah, of, way back. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, it's one of those systems that's likely you know gotten really low before um mm. but if you, as long as you have a, a refuge if we can get the eagle uh, uh eagle lake rainbows back up into the headwaters mm-hmm. um and likely that hopefully won't go dry you've always got that repository of fish up there that can come back and and populate when there. the flows are when the flows make are it possible exactly basically. and the lake okay. levels go back up when I the lake it. levels drop down it gets pretty tough to as yeah. a, for a for a trout yeah so uh, are those fish uh, do you know about how they're stocked in other parts of the state? Eagle oh, Lake. We, we we utilize them. They're a great fish for uh, alkaline lakes. Mm-hmm. So they, they are a good one for like Crowley mm-hmm. um, and some of those where they can actually, uh, you know, uh, perform better mm-hmm. because they're used to that high alkalinity at, at Eagle. They've evolved that way. Um, so they really do well there. I'm not sure how they perform in other waters, like, you know, something on the West slope that's highly granitic and it's not alkaline. I'm not, I'm not sure how they would perform, but they do well in those other kind of desert type lakes. Right. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. A Philbrook was one of them that was, that I know that they're mm-hmm. planted in at some time. Are they, is that part of this genetic, now that you have all this genetics taking place in studies, is, is that going to be, you know, basically looked at care- more carefully as far as putting those fish in different places and all that? I mean, is that? Yeah, you know, a great question. And, and part of this whole strategic trout rollout that, you know, you mm-hmm. were talking about, mm-hmm. um, um, I call it the trout renaissance because we're going back and looking at all aspects of what we do with trout management mm-hmm. and really to boil it down our mantra that I kind of play out and I talk to at the, at the public meetings is the right fish at the right time for the right reasons. Um, and that gets to your point from the genetics to the strain that we're going to mm-hmm. pick to uh, how many we put in and why we put them in. Um, so we're, we're reevaluating on a global scale within the state of why we do, you know, anything with trout. So with, with respect to the genetics and the management of the technology, right? There's new stuff that's coming out, um, CRISPR, the gene editing tool where you can actually go in and actually dice and slice DNA strands. And Mm -hmm. basically the promise of it is you can basically genetically engineer anything. Um, there could be a time where you actually select different attributes of a a genome for a particular fish and start splicing them together. This is (laughs) real stuff, by the way, (laughs) Uh, not kidding. Um, are you guys right now just focused on eugenics types of programs? So you're just breeding 
you doing just doing breeding there's no editing going on or anything like no, that no there's no jurassic park going on in the department <laughs> um I mean, I, the technology is amazing right yeah. it's it's incredible what they're finding and um uh, our federal partners are are actually looking to see they may have typed you know some uh, diagnostic markers that they can determine whether or not that fish is predisposed to go out to salt through a, a growth um, mm. a, a gene. So there's all kinds of really, I mean, it's just, it's just amazing and it's blown up, but we're not doing anything crazy yet as far as gene splicing. And really we just want to make sure we're doing the right responsible thing in breeding those fish and cr- uh, increasing genetic diversity. When That's, when you said they're predisposed to go out to salt, you guys figured out a marker that says these this particular trout could become a steelhead. Is that what you're saying? So so Carlos Garza and yeah. um, out of the Santa Cruz um, shop, and uh, I'm trying to think. And I'm going to forget people. I'm sure that were involved in that. They've been looking at all these different uh, genes, and they're seeing some connections in really lar- in relation to potentially anatomy and these this growth code. So yeah, interesting. So that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. I think it's still early on. Um, but you know, it's, it's something seemed to be aligning. So it's just, it's just the beginning, you know, it's di- the whole issue with genetics and breeding, it, you know, we like to come on and say, and we were talking about the McLeod and there's probably historically a lot of mixing that went on with red bands and steelhead in the upper Sacramento basin. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we like to pigeonhole things a lot of times and go, that's what you're supposed to do. And that's what you're supposed to look like. But um, species in general don't behave that way. They right. mix, they adapt, they find and on in general as a, and if we weren't here, you're saying, yeah, yep. there would have been a lot of from the Kern plateau and those golden trout and the Kern river rainbows. Um, and, and the upper Sacramento basin, there's probably a lot of different phenotypes is what we yeah. call them. And so, you know, to, to say this is what is going to be a stillhead or this is what's going to be a golden trout is kind of a trap we try to avoid. Yeah. We want to make sure there's as much what we call the genetic diversity so they can deal with stochastic events and climate change. Their own, yeah, their own survival. Yeah. yeah. So the yeah. more tools, genetic, you know, tools in their toolbox, the better off they're going to be able to persist. So, Well, that's mm. I was going to bring that up because we, we met with some guys at Fish Bio and they talked about how, you know, a, a rainbow trout can either be a rainbow trout or it can be a steelhead depending on the variables that are, you know, in, in, their, in their environment. Warm water, not a lot of biomass kind of leads to a fish wanting to get out of there and leave and mm-hmm. go find something, become a steelhead. Yeah. Um, where the opposite, if it's cold water, there's tons of food. They don't need to go anywhere. They can stay there and be a trout. So it, it's with that in mind and, and what you're just saying, you know, you think about the fish that were locked into these lakes when the dams were put up. Right. And we had talked about that, the McLeod mm-hmm. and like all these places. And they may have been in like mid transit going up to spawn and then they were going to turn around and go back to the ocean. So at some break, point. I don't know. Is there a way to break that down into simple, <laughs> to simplify what you're, you're talking about as far as, cause you were, you were you, and basically what you just said, you, you know, we're tracking these fish, but we're not going to take those genetics and try to put them in other places. Um, we don't want to screw that pool up. But we're still going to monitor. I guess I I have a hard time grasping all that, you know. And, and <laughs> yeah, it's 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 complex, and and I think part of it is that you know, at least for me, I'm I'm a little apprehensive to play God in yeah. relation to making that call, and that's why, as an example, you look at the Central Valley and those above rim dam fish. You know, yeah. exclusive of us stocking. Let's say we we never stock those fish. Yeah, there's going to be a portfolio of genetics in those fish that were stuck up there. Yeah. Some may have been predisposed to go out to the ocean. Some may have been predisposed to be resident. Right. That's their portfolio. So for us to be selective and saying, that's the one that we're yeah. going to select to k- take down to Nimbus and grow <laughs> out a steelhead. Right. I get a little bit nervous about that. <laughs> yeah. I'd rather err on the side of having their full portfolio sure. and mm-hmm. let the, the habitat. We talked about the Yuba. Those fish don't care what we call them. They just know what life history and phenotype works right yeah. whoever whoever has the most kids wins at this point so. yeah i like the 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 notion of calling it a portfolio also because it's a it really you are describing like a low risk kind of a stock play right where you you take many <laughs> different stocks as opposed to put all your money in one stock well that was a gamble i didn't know i know nothing about 
uh, stocks, and I just seem like a good word to use. For that. <laughs> that's so, I don't perfect. Know. It's okay. a perfect okay. analogy, man. Okay. Well, the, yeah. and going to the back to the Yuba that and the sack, there was, there was steelhead super abundant. You know, just even ten years ago, and it seems like that drought and I don't know the death of a thousand cuts. I always talk about has hurt that. What have you noticed on on the Yuba in regards to those fish? I mean, have you seen them disappear? You did talk about. The trout, how they, I guess they move a lot up and yeah. down th- that river. Talk, yeah. Talk about that a little bit. I yeah. Guess. I mean, they, they do what they need to do to survive and they're yeah. going to hedge their bed and they're, um, they got great plasticity in, in trying to figure out new things and, and try new things. The Yuba is a pretty dynamic, it's not what it was originally, right? The, yeah. All the tailings and everything, and there's high scour and it's hard to be a bug in the mm-hmm. Yuba, especially mm-hmm. at high flow. Um, what we found through our evaluations is they're highly migratory, but that doesn't mean they go to the ocean. Right. It means they could go out to the sack. They could go yep. down to the Delta. Yep. Um, we saw them, you know, definitely key in on the salmon and chase the egg drop, mm-hmm. um, in, in large numbers. I we, see that in other rivers a oh, lot I'm too. I'm sure. I'm all sure. Over, all these tribs on the sack. I mean, yeah. they do, I think they do a lot yeah. of that. I mean, it's a free, it's a good lunch. So right. yeah, it's, it's worth them to them energetically to go chase that protein mm-hmm. pack. Right. And, and so, uh, that probably at some level happened historically, but, you know, like we we're talking now they can, especially on the lower sack, you know, in, in the redding section, man, they can, they can eat caddish year round yeah. there. And that's yeah. a different scenario altogether than what historically happened there. So that's a game changer for that. And, and the scales and, and a lot of the information that we evaluate on the Yuba show that, that it's mm-hmm. literally out of 800 fish. I think we found five salty fish. Wow. Um, not to say that those fish don't move around sure. and that they're not going to be, you know, 20 or 21 inches and super hot that happens on the Yuba and mm-hmm. a lot of people go, oh, I got to steal it today. And it doesn't necessarily bear out that that's a salty fish. Mm. So don't play God, do, do the studies, figure out the genetics and then work on conservation, work on habitat restoration, do the things that we can do to make it those, the lives of these fish better. Right? Yeah. You make it sound easy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sounds super easy. <laughs> yeah. I feel good now. So, um, yeah, it's the uh, water habitat. You know, we talked about that. Mm-hmm. Let fix those things and you maintain the genetic diversity and those fish will, will find a they'll, way. They'll find, I, I say that all the time. Yeah. They'll find I, a way I was waiting time. for him to say it. This episode. Like, all right. Is he going to say it? Yeah, say it'll it? find a way. He's, he's Jurassic like, Park. Just finds it's, a way. That's that Jurassic Park quote. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Well, um, this has all been super good information. Ta- um, a- another thing that gets complicated are regs, right? Fishing yeah. regulations. Yeah. I still can't figure it out. Tell, talk to us a little bit First about Saturday that. Saturday then... preceding Memorial Weekend. <laughs> Let me just dictionary preceding one more time. I think I know what it means. Yeah. It's uh, – so this goes way back. And I remember as a naive, you know, biologist – uh, looking at those regs going, oh, we we could fix this, right? right? This is just so complex. It doesn't make sense that from the delineation of some of the reaches that's closed or open and the seasons and the gear. And so, but when you actually sit down and go through the whatever, the 250 plus special regs in the freshwater, um, wow. there's a history behind every single one. Mm-hmm. There's ownership, local ownership within the community. Influencing it. And, and, um, and, and history, right? So, and uh, some of the biologists and the rationale that they came up with some of those regs is completely gone now. And so you're talking about 80 plus years of, you know, uh, dynamic evolution of regs that some people remember and some people have no clue why we have them. So, mm-hmm. But they're still all in there. But they're still all in there. So a lot of baggage. It, th- there is a lot of baggage <laughs> and it's, it's, it's super complex. So we took it upon ourselves to take it on the challenge. Um, we looked for different ways to kind of navigate through that, um, without losing the integrity of, of the reg. I mean, we're, we're a super diverse state in regards to habitat and fisheries. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're not kidding anybody by thinking, oh, we're going to come up with one reg and that's going to be it. Right. Sure. Um, so the main thing we want to do is not lose the integrity of the management objective to, to protect and manage the fishery, but also look for opportunities, increase opportunities. So- our goal now is to kind of come up with a bin of regs that make sense, you know, and, mm-hmm. and like we were talking, I think earlier, we have 88 different seasons 
and we don't need 88 different seasons. And you're, when you say that, you're talking about so last Saturday in April to November 15th. Or and or May 31st to October Just, just time intervals, basically. Right. Yeah, so I, we plotted it out and looked at all these different, you know, um, scenarios and combinations, and it was shocking. It was like, oh, my gosh, you know, yeah. just from the gear restrictions to the size and slot limits to the seasons, and it's it, it's – there's a reason, like I said, every single one of those, somebody came up with a good idea at mm-hmm. one point, but mm-hmm. in many cases, we forgot what that good idea was or why we had it. And they didn't necessarily think we should make this the same, uh, you know, as the next county over. And so now we're paying for pass ins in relation to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we're going to be reaching out to anglers in the communities and saying, okay, this is, we're going to start with just coming up with good standard methodology and management approaches. We're going to ma- use this reg to manage for trophy trout. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, we're going to use this one for fast action to allow for people to use bait. Mm-hmm. And we're, we'll build that suite or what we call a menu. And then we'll go across with all our fisheries managers and go, all right, you know, uh, go ahead and look at your waters right now and select something from the menu. And then we'll go back to the public and go, this is what we came up with. Interesting. Okay. Um, huh. One of the one of the the other thing is that I like that you're going to the anglers and to give the it, feedback. I mean that's that's awesome. Yeah, it's it's something we we haven't done enough of. Yeah. And one of the things when we did the the stakeholder meetings and we did seven uh, around the state for these different plans in the regs, I came up with a, a concept of the questionnaire to get input because um, mm-hmm. I I do public meetings and we you know go to the ISE and we go to sports shows and we talk to guys like you and it's awesome dialogue but then in the end we didn't capture it necessarily as far as data or what was important to everybody and the values that that for the for the different things that we talk about so we created these questionnaires and um, I think we're at thirty five hundred questionnaires and wow. normally if you do at least from the people that do this on a regular basis they said if you get over 100 you're doing well so obviously people are interested in this stuff yeah. um i'm super excited because we have all this data to go back to and comments to kind of go okay are, are we getting close to the mark do we know why people hate the regs and why do they hate the regs yeah. that way it feeds into our process and so we're not just telling everybody this is what we're going to do yeah. and do you like it or do you think it sucks we actually asked everybody in the and so we're going to do a lot more of that is is, is my hope yeah my oh, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so once you, you guys kind of codify that and, and get feedback from the community, when are you going to make it all public? So the timeline is in 2018, we're going to be working on the menu that I referenced, you know, mm-hmm. coming up with the, mm-hmm. those different guilds and strategies for management. And then in 2019, same time about this year, we'll do the roadshow. That'll be when, when the department goes out to the different geographic areas and local communities and say, this is what we were thinking about these waters. So the regs are going to be completely changed, wholesale changed in the, within say four years. Theoretically, if this all pans out, we'll be looking at, um, 2020 March of 2020 that the, fir- they- the first phase, and that'll be, if this works out, we'll have two basic booklets one will be what you guys may remember is our supplemental yep. that's the one that yeah, comes yeah, out yeah. that's yep. kind that's of got, dynamic it's got the klamath and exactly. the trinity and every yeah yeah and the reason why we had that is because of we have to generate those quota numbers after we do our normal big booklet right so as part of the strategy i decided why don't we run to that light and have an anatomist book because that's the yep. the, the greatest volatility yep. in the change so Great. we would have an anatomist book and then mm-hmm. the main book um, and then hopefully through that process, if you guys, one of the challenges that we face that is the district boundaries and through this process, we'll probably get rid of that altogether. There will be no district. So you won't have to worry about highway, this and county, highway, county, none line. Of that. county none of that. Yeah. So I have a county story. So I was trying to figure <laughs> out if the, the middle fork of the feather was mm-hmm. open during between like, you know, basically winter's off season. Yeah. So winter. Yeah, and I called I called our uh, Chad Alexander, who's you know he's a he, he's a, a warden in Butte County, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, he's on the show, and he didn't know for sure because that's not his jurisdiction. So yeah. he said he'd call his friend, but I, I'm like going tomorrow, and I didn't know how long it was going to take. So I just got on the cell phone and started calling agency after agency. I talked to four different agencies, got different a- answers. Some said it was closed, some said it was open. Not until Chad called me back, you know, he got back to me finally. He and his buddy that is that's his beat. He said, "Yeah, it's open." I'm like, holy shit! 
You know, it's, it's like, well, it's I mean, just a mess. It, it, you know? it is, and that one's, and I'll give you that another. That one's gnarly. That so the middle fork in the lower section is open, and it's actually really killer in, in Butte County. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and that back in the day when I was young and had the time and would hunt those winter waters. Um, that was one that was open. The North Fork Yuba is another interesting one in regards to the interpretation of the regs because the county line is the river. Mm-hmm. So one side of the river is one <laughs> county that's open and the other side is closed. I don't, I can't remember if, I, I don't know if we changed that since then, but back in the nineties, wow. I asked that question. And so, you know, obviously common sense, like the warden said, it all depends what side of the river you're well, standing on, standing on. I go, well, Jeez. if I'm waiting and I cast over the other side and he goes, you're asking too many questions, you know? Just go conservative and don't fish it. So that's, again, <laughs> is the reason why I'm motivated yeah, and passionate about fixing yeah. this stuff. And those district boundaries are one of the main things people complain about. And so when I looked at consolidation and simplification, like, let's just get rid of them um, yeah. and, and really focus on the fisheries that need to be protected with special regs and put them mm-hmm. in the special reg and call it good. Do so. you see rivers going to – more rivers going to fly fishing only or anything like that? Do you see that as a potential – um, you know, it's it's interesting. Having looked at the data on a lot of waters, one of the things that I've seen as an evolution is um, in waters where we don't have many fly fishing only waters. Right. There's like less than a, less than a half dozen. Yeah. Um, but by default, the constituents, the anglers that go to you said you're going to go to the pit. So we did an evaluation on the pit, pit three and pit four. And by and large, even though you can use um, lures. On, on some of these special reg waters, the largest constituent base, like over 80% is, angle, is flying Fly anglers. Fishers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they kind of self-segregate, and it's kind of a human dimensions issue that's really intriguing to me. <laughs> um, so ultimately, to me, unless we have a good, sound biological management reason to do a fly-only water, and I'm a diehard fly angler, right. I, I don't know why we would self-regulate uh, and, and, and not allow somebody to use lures because – in, you know, in the instance where we do have it, they don't really go there anyway. It's really, right. if there's a special reg that our data, when we mm-hmm. evaluate it, the fly anglers go there and the other traditional anglers, the power bait guys or the lure guys go to mm-hmm. harvest based mm-hmm. fisheries. And that brings up my point, I guess, is, you know, I look at uh, some of these anadromous waters that um, will close down during the season that the salmon are coming in, right? They're coming in. We're protecting the salmon. We're going to close this like river down. Like Creek's an example. You can't, you can't fish it. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I don't know. You just don't see, in my mind, you don't see the fly fishermen going in there to snag a salmon, right? I do, and I have seen the other, you know, conventional. I'm not knocking them. I love conventional fishing. I, I do both. I love them both. Um, you, it's just easier to get away with some of that stuff and and do those sort of things. So that's... I guess that's where my mind frame comes from is by making it fly fishing only. You have these people in there that are going to be stewards of the land and and still protecting the water, but you could open that window up a little bit further and still fish it, even when those salmon are around because there's good dry fly fishing, you yeah. know, or something like that. I guess that's that's my mind frame is that we can all become not wardens, but stewards, you know, and to, to help these fisheries. What it, does that make sense at all? Or it, it's, it's a struggle. Um, <laughs> it, it, se- it seems to me like you'd have to manage to the lowest, lowest common denominator, meaning you've got to manage to the guy that's, that's going to abuse it. Right. And put the regs around that kind of a, a situation. Yeah. You know, and that's where we end up getting, yeah, right. So it, you always, it's like speeding limits, right. Yeah. You know, so we, in, in that section that we closed for the winter run on in Reading was one of those things. And we had yep. public meetings about that. Yeah, I think it's great. I think it's a great thing. And and so we had to look at that. And there was guys that wanted to float to the bridge, you know, and wanted to do the sundial. And when the winters were in there and, you know, they were floating size, you know, 20, you know, midges underneath. And How's so that gonna, yeah. how, what are the odds of a bycatch right. issue? And so- right. You know, we that, that's for us to get through. And I, when I get to that point, I, I really hope that we have the science to be able to back that up right. and be able to say, you know, um, we have the data, we we evaluated and we surveyed that fishery, and we found that it was a less than one percent, you know, 
um, encounter rate with the the fly fishermen versus the, the the lure folks, right? So you get to that lowest common denominator, and then potentially through special regs, you could have a fly only. Um, mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. we need the science. We just can't go off of our gut, and that's right. you got to get the data to back. Got to get the data from like the flossing issue or a bead issue. Or talk about you, you guys were saying, about yeah. That. What's uh, what's flossing? I have no idea. Talk about that a little bit. <laughs> um, I said that a couple times. Before. So, and I've seen it since. I mean, this goes back to the 80s, um, and especially sure. when you have uh, congregations of spawning salmon, especially, mm-hmm. and sometimes even steelhead, uh, there was a technique that was pretty well developed and mastered in the Central Valley rivers that they would use very long leaders and neutrally buoyant beads on a on a curved, like Gamagatsu. Well, it came from Alaska, probably, originally, is they, where it came from. Yeah. And, and that's, uh, they still do it to this day. They, yeah. They still do it up there. And it's just a really effective technique because you can use a greater than 15 foot or greater than 10 foot long leader. And that thing just floats through and then slides through the open gate of Flossing. a salmon's mouth. Uh, and then once okay. you get resistance, you can set that hook and ping that fish on the outside, usually with the hook. Um, Got it. You need the congregation of those fish to show up. You need the right habitat and velocity to make it effective. We've had it on the Central Valley Feather American, um, the Klamath. You know, those were significant issues um, for our enforcement folks to deal with, and folks that legitimately wanted to, you know, get those fish to strike volitionally with a lure. Um, but again, it was just talk, right? We all like, well, we hate this, you know, this is not potentially illegitimate. This is, you know, the anglers talking. Um, and so we had multiple meetings with a snagging committee with the Central Valley anglers, um, the guides, uh, the NGOs, the, those organizations. And they threw it back on me and say, come up with a study to, to deal with this. Oh, geez. So... I came up with a plan during uh, on the American during the close season to to get volunteer anglers to go out and evaluate varying leader lengths using that technique and see if we reduced leader length, um, we would see a reduction in the foul hooking. Wow. Thinking that, you know, whatever the outcome of that study, it's going to, you know, provide us some information to make a reg change if necessary. And interestingly enough, there was no change in the amount of foul hooking that occurred from any of the leader links um, because they were all high. So, you know, uh, it's over 80% across the board. But what we did see is that when you started from a short leader length and you went out, your your capture efficiency went up. Sure. And so that was enough for us to be able to go, well, there's not much we can do. We're not going to penalize the bluegill fishermen with a three, you know, three foot long leader. I looked at all these different angling techniques, from trolling to the fly angling guides, both bobbers and weights, and, all of that. Know. And the last thing we wanted to do was penalize, you know, a, a legitimate angling technique. Um, so, and looking at the data, we felt really, really uh, good about the fact that we wouldn't impact if we use six feet. Um, and the fly guys were exempted through this with the integrated sink tips and all that other stuff. It right. has to do with we the, saw that. I saw that. Yeah. yeah. So if you look it, at, and you read the actual, re- I, right. It reads a little, but you're it, right. It's squirrely, but I had yeah. to write it that way. Sure. So I didn't ding, you know, the steelhead guys, I didn't ding the guys on the sack that are trolling for stripers. Yeah. So if you read where the hook is versus where the weight is and how we define weight mm-hmm. really, and a lot of the fly guys, they were super concerned. And then I yeah. walk them through the reg and they're like, okay, this yeah. is, this is okay. Yeah. But we had to get that science to be able to go to the commission and i'm really glad we covered this because there's been i've heard people just having you know conversations that oh that long leaders are completely out and you know as a fly Uh, person oh yeah oh yeah Uh, Yeah. i get those calls so okay should we bring it up and read it um the reg yeah uh, Verbatim, um, like Google it. Yeah. Okay, give me a second. Because <laughs> yeah, I didn't memorize don't, it. Don't so put I'm it up on the main screen yet. All right. <laughs> so uh, and then you also did a study with beads. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that was another Just one. Google California regulation six foot leader. And then uh, we're getting there, guys. Promise. There you go. 2018, 19 freshwater sport fishing. Right here. Uh, yep. Okay. I think who's the model. Uh, she was on our wild trout crew last year. <laughs> Giggity. <laughs> All right. Leader length restriction. Yeah. This one? Yeah. So that's kind of an overview um, along with the Nimbus closure. That So I should see section 2.05. If you want the verbatim, yeah. Okay. 
Nick wants to verbatim, so I we're going to okay. yeah. let's section let's read 2.05. It. Might as well read it. We were talking about it. Five, not six. Five. Zero five, actually. Oh, that's why I can't find it. There it is. All right. Yeah, that when, when, only one. Uh, when we're trying to do the regs, it's amazingly mm-hmm. difficult to make sure you don't impact something else when you're trying to well, why don't you guys things. keep talking so our listener doesn't fall asleep tell, and then i'll, so uh, I'll it, find this you mentioned about the bead study um uh explain a little bit about so that. we were getting some um some conflicting information and concern from anglers in relation to the effect of uh beads on uh on primarily anadromous waters so the Yuba, the Trinity, some of those areas that beads are heavily used. And some folks were confused on whether or not it was legal, not legal. And, you know, some people were giving information about, well, as long as you do it within two inches, then it's all good, which is kind of similar to, I think, the Bristol Bay um, reg, which is the only reg out there really. That um, involves beads. That involves beads. Yeah. The, the, the New York and the Great Lakes, I think they may have some new stuff. But again, I was hearing all this stuff and I was like, uh, we need to get some science behind this. Um, so I reached out to Alaska and everybody else, talked to some um, biologists that had published, Julie Mecca out of Arizona, who worked in uh, uh I think it was Moraine Creek up mm-hmm. in, in Alaska, and she'd done some work. I'm like asking it, but nobody had really got to the science about, you know, those different distances, you know, from zero to mm-hmm. two to four to and, six. And I was busy looking at the leader length stuff, which I found, but I want to just, so I'm coming in halfway through the conversation. You guys are talking about pegging beads, correct? Yeah, correct. Okay. Yep. And yep. the, the so, distance between the hook and where the actual yeah, bead is Yeah, so pegged. for the folks that don't know what the heck we're talking about, um, somebody described pegging beads. No, it's again. Really it's quick. just it's taking a bead and pegging it with some something, either wrapping your line through it a couple times or using a toothpick of some sort, but mm-hmm. pegging it above a bear hook. Well, it could be a fly or whatever, but above and a bear a bear hook. The reason it works is no, it's just a, it looks like an egg. It, it floats down and looks like a natural egg. That's the, and with a yeah. bead, you can you can use a pretty good imitation of what a natural salmon egg looks like. Yeah. So it's a very effective way to catch fish. And the thing that was kind of like counterintuitive to me when i first saw this rig and i was with nick um because the bead is like very far away from the hook i'm like how the heck does that even snag a <laughs> how does that hook a fish and basically it they just suck the bead in the hook follows behind them you set and the bead comes out of its mouth but the hook stays in yeah you're throwing me under right? the bus a little bit it wasn't that <laughs> far from the hook yeah, in we fact were. i make it sure that it's super close it and was then, about six inches and right? i, and oh, I, okay. I think the uh, size of the hook is another thing that's important too and especially like the smaller the fish you, you know you shouldn't be using something like a Four size four hooks. So those treble hooks that you were pegging. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you go to you go to some larger species. You can you know it, it makes and it, I've especially big steelhead. I've never, I, rarely ever, maybe a half a percent of the time see a hook on the outside of the fish. Right. If you do it right, you should always be in the corner of the mouth or you know inside the mouth. But yeah, it's still it's but a lot of people it, don't know that. So it's a it's a tough. And you brought up that point about the distance when we saw, I think two, two or three fish with gill plates torn off one side of their their yeah. head, you know, completely torn off. Yeah, Could, you know, using oversized yeah. hook or having a big separation between the beads. So anyway, let, I we I kind of got us off on a bunny hole, but I wanted to make sure <laughs> that other folks that knew, who no, didn't that, know what beads beads were all about. No, that's a great yeah. point. And this conversation is what we had, you know, for. <laughs> over 15 years and that's why i was like we got to get some science behind Mm. addressing all the things you guys Mm -hmm. are talking about because um a lot of time in in the moment when you're unhooking that fish you don't necessarily think about where those hooks are getting inserted right yeah and one of the other things that we saw in a lot of our fisheries was the maxillary process which is that some people call it the mandible Mm -hmm. um were torn the yuba was where it first came to light to me Mm because we were doing our study and during the egg drop, um, and it's not always torn off, but the membrane is ripped, yeah. and then so it sloughs off. Is that in the the roof of the mouth, top of the on mouth, the side. Side? outside, yeah, oh, outside? So we're talking outside, yeah, yeah. the maxilla. Okay. 
Okay. So one of the one of the artifacts of that issue was the interpretation of our regs in regards to a snagged fish, which was in the mouth. Historically, that definition was in the mouth. So again, we get back to the regs, right? Somebody, it was a good idea at one point. Well, how do you define in the mouth? So during those years when we had the snagging subcommittee meetings, I brought forth, I'm like, why don't we just say inside the mouth? And then we actually can act, define where that hook point insertion is. Because in the mouth, when you're in you know, an area where there's high levels of snagging and flossing occurring, and that hook is on the outside um, when they're flossing those salmon, uh, that's a legit fish, you know, or at least it's going to be hard to defend in a court of law against a judge saying, right. well, define in the mouth. What's that mean? Right. I know that was Bill Clinton's defense and it didn't work too <laughs> well. <Jeez. laughs> I was waiting. I, I had that joke like primed for like 10 seconds, waiting for the right moment. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, yeah. So so we changed changed the language and now it's inside the mouth. We did that. I don't know what year it was. And that helped to kind of refine how we we're going to look at and design the study to get at this foul hooking issue with, with the flossing. But it also fits into the bead. And so I don't know if you want me to give you the like low down on what we did with that study or you want yeah. to talk about the well, – We can go back to the leader. Let's, we'll read I'd this. Like to, yeah, well, tell, tell us about yeah, this, let's the study. It. Okay. We can um, – so – same thing, conversations over the years. Is it two inches distance? Um, uh, what is the injury rate, uh, size of hook? So to standardize that, I went out and talked to everybody who, you know, guides on the Trinity or the Yuba, and, and we got the hook point, you know, the hook size dialed in, the Gamagatsu, you know, basically a circle hook. And then I stratified out from zero to two to four to six to eight. Um, inches. Inches. Mm -hmm. And then – caught a lot of fish with, I think, 50 different anglers. And we would rotate those distances during the egg drop um, and evaluate hook point insertion, where that actual hook point went in. Uh, injury rate, you know, was it deep hooked? Was it on the maxillary in the process? And, and then um, took that data and then the size of the fish hmm. and then evaluated uh, the gape width. And ran that number. And then I took it one step further and actually designed a fly, which I called the tether, which actually took the bead on the backside off of monofilament off a hook. So now we just didn't have zero. We had a negative one or negative one and a half. I think I've seen stuff like that where they heat the, the hook up and sink the plastic bead in. That the was what shank. we did for the zero. So that okay. was zero was uh, a melted bead. Mm -hmm. okay. And then I actually tethered with some mono and adhered a bead to the backside of the hook. So the, the hook was in front of the bead okay. to the leader. Oh, interesting. That was negative. That was negative. Gotcha. Um, and then we took um, another really compelling thing was we took underwater video and evaluated because we saw some dramatic changes in the catch per unit effort across those different systems, especially when we went to the, the melted bead. I mean, we just didn't hardly catch any fish, and we knew the fish were there. That's so right. we're like, all right, so we got you know the, one of these AquaView cameras that looks like a blue bluegill, and we called them Creepy Nemo. We stuck <laughs> Creepy Nemo out behind the reds and watched how those fish reacted to those different systems. Whoa. And vastly different reaction with the neutrally buoyant, non-melted bead. That thing acts differently in the sure. water. and But more importantly, when they come up to it uh, with – even when they commit on a melted bead, they come up, and when they get within two inches, they turn around and and, and, and divert, whereas that there's no hook in it, even though there's a leader going through because it's a wrap system, uh, they would suck it down. So there's probably a little of both is being able to see the hook, you know, melted on it, and then the actual flotation and action of a non-buoyant. Mm -hmm. That's why I did the tether system. So when we did the tether system, we alleviated the hook st stuck to the bead, um, and it changed and the CPU went back up. Hmm. Um, so we did, we had pretty good results. How with long the did you do this for? How many years? Or probably seasons? five. Wow. We caught probably over 2,000 fish. Wow. Landed. And are, are, are there, are that, is that study posted online somewhere too? No. No. Okay. No, I, it, it's one of the, I, I probably have like six or seven manuscripts that I got, but I don't have the time anymore. Um, the one that the barbless fly one I got published, but all the rest are, the data has already been crunched and everything. I just got to yeah. write it up. Okay. Uh -huh. That'd be There'd be a lot of people interested. No, in I know, I know. We've, <laughs> and we've I'm had... gonna, I'm gonna ask you some stuff off, off air. <laughs> <laughs> um. So yeah, it was really interesting. What we found was that, 
uh, for the zero to two, uh, we saw the lowest amount of foul hooking, and the foul hooking was a uh, hook point insertion outside of the inside of the mouth, right? It's on the outside. Mm-hmm. Um, the maxillary process that we talked about, which for the average angler, if they hook them right there in that slit, it looks like it's in the mouth. I mean, most people that came out and volunteered with us, they're like, oh, it's in the mouth. I'm like, let's get it in the net. Let's look. I'm like, no, see where the hook point came in? Yeah, yeah. When you look at the, and you understand the physics of how that system works, it's going to go like a grappling hook to the first hard structure edge that it gets to, right. and that maxillary is the first spot. Right. Then it slides in and hooks right at the juncture of the V, just like for flossing. Right. So it's in the mouth, right? And so historically, it would have been fine under our regs. But I was more interested in the injury rate, the sloughing mm-hmm. of the maxillary, and what what was the mechanics of that whole system. Um, and again, we could see it, you know, in the video too, it was kind of compelling when you see how they reacted and how that hook stuck them right in the side. We got mm-hmm. some underwater video that was pretty cool. So that, you know, again, it was, I think for the two inch, we were at about a 40% foul hooking occurrence. And then it just went up from there, you know, out at eight inches, you're almost exclusively foul hooking in fish. In the eyeball or where, yeah. Wherever. And the other thing that was kind of cool with the underwater videos, you guys know this. I mean, these fish center pin their their quarry and they suck stuff in. Yep. So they actually will put their eye right right up to the the bait or whatever it is, and then turn their head, suck in, and then go back. Right. right. That's kind of mm-hmm. so that so one of the things that I thought about, and so we we started getting the metrics on is the gape of of the fish. So if you think about it as a whole, and you measure the difference all the way across a eight pound steelhead you barely can get to two inches. It's usually about just over two inches. So when the bead goes in the middle, because that's where it gets sucked in, now you're talking about an inch distance. And then you add the additional length from the eye to the hook point, and you're already out outside the mouth. So sometimes, you know, what we saw also on the video is that they'll suck that hook in first when they do that vacuum when you do that, then you're going to get it in the inside of the mouth. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But most of the time when people fish beads, and I'm sure you guys know this, Nick, it's usually kind of on a swing. It's not always on a perfect dead drift. So that hook is usually dragging on the mm-hmm. lateral position, mm-hmm. which is already setting it up. If it's a perfect dead drift, a lot of times it'll probably get sucked in first before the the bead does. Gotcha. Um, but it was it was a cool study. It was really interesting to yeah. see the data. and Very cool. Um more so on the reaction of the fish when we did the zero point and they just wouldn't go after it. And as soon as we switched over, it was lights out. There, there's the probably point. at least a few people that use a zero point rig that are going right now listening going, <laughs> damn. Oh, I, <laughs> I, I did it for years just because, I, you know, it that, just logically seems it like made it sense. Would yeah. Yeah. And, uh, there, um, Dave Schaefer that used to, he used to guide on the, on the Yuba. I showed him my box and he was just like, and there was probably 200 melted beads, all different <laughs> colors, you know, nail polish system. And he looked at that, he goes, man, that's a lot of melting, dude. You really did all that. <laughs> but he was, you know, we, again, we were in the, like, this is the best way to do it. And, uh, with the melted bead, the other, the other criticism on those things in glow bugs is they deep hook. And, um, mm. uh, you know, again, in our experience and our data, deep hook meaning they'll go into the gills exactly, and, and hook a gill or, or a in trout the down throat. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. so that was a big deal. I think primarily in Alaska, Julie found some of that because I think they're having people that aren't very experienced. Mm-hmm. Um, we also looked at that. We looked at angler experience too in in the analysis. Um, I think if you have inexperienced anglers that can't watch a bobber. Um, those fish voraciously attack those beads. And so if you're not paying attention and you had a melted bead, you could, it could get deep hooked. But most of the time, if you're watching that barber, it's so voracious and you set the hook in time, it's, it's not an issue, but. Mm. How did barb and barbless come into play? As far as the bead one or just in general? So, um, again, it was one of those, I, I, I had seen the reg for years and always wondered, you know, am I losing fish because of a barbless reg? And do I land less fish because of a barbless reg? And do we really need it? And then it was the little truckie that hit it home when I heard one of our anglers come to me and he goes, I just got pinched for 1200 bucks for a barbless violation on the little truckie for a, you know, size 18 betas. He's all explained to me what the biological rationale for having a barbless, you know, for that particular fishery with that size hook. Is it really? And I was like, okay, sounds like a cool study. Let's do it. So again, 
um, we we looked at uh, the effect of that, and and we called it the capture efficiency, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and a- again, it was negligible, really. Um, and so it really kind of questions the efficacy of having a barbless rig. Obviously, if you hook it in, you know, yourself in the arm or your pet, safety, your kid, right? There's the safety issue, and no one's going to argue that. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a, we looked at the handling time, we looked at injury rates. Um, one of the more interesting, you know, as a side note, I was looking at some of our really good sticks that were in our study and they actually had an increase in, uh, capture Land, efficiency, landing ratio. uh, with barbless. Yep. I think they just got a better, better hook, you get a hook set and faster yeah. and more efficient. Mm. Um, so, but that, that we didn't have enough and I, I categorized the anglers I had to do in three categories and those guys were like ultra, ultra anglers and they mm-hmm. didn't, they didn't have a category, but I was yeah. watching going. Those guys are like tilting at the other direction. Yeah, that that one you almost have to have a control group that from a proficiency standpoint, right? Yeah, because there's yeah. you put a barbless hook in two fish and the anglers are dis, you know the disparity in skill set is is high. The guy that obviously knows how to fight that fish, turn that fish is yeah, going to have exactly. a higher capture rate. No, right? it makes sense if you're contact with that fish, you know, if an advanced angler will be hundred percent of the time that that hook is going to go in further to that fish's mouth without a barb. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, if, and if the barbs there, that's just something that's going to get in the way of that penetration potentially. Yeah. It's it's physics at that point. And then if, if they're experienced like you were saying, Chad, once you actually put tension, it's actually pretty difficult to get that hook unbuttoned unless you make a mistake and mm-hmm. get slack line where that's where the and novice comes I in. think, you know, having – we've talked – Nick and I have talked about this a lot. We were like the, the whole state should just be barbless, but I don't know how controversial that would be. But um, I don't know. I don't really see a need. What do you think about that? So – so just to make sure you got you guys know the results of the study is that it, it was overwhelmingly significant that the barbed fish barbed hooks caught more fit landed more fish. Right. And that's like, you know, my, my buddies oh you did a study on the firm grasp of the obvious bloom. And I'm like, yeah, but we didn't have that data. So one of the things to consider uh, is if you have a fishery that is harvest based, you got a five ten, you know, five daily ten fish and you want people to harvest that. You don't necessarily want a yeah, barbless. That's, that's mm-hmm. a great because point. Because we yeah. want that harvest to, to change the biomass or shift and, and, sure. and, and allow right. for those those people that want to harvest fish, which is our, our customer too. But if you've got a listed fish, right? Let's say you've got an anatomous fishery, mm-hmm. you know, a mm-hmm. listed steelhead or a cutthroat or something like that, you want to optimize your chance of survival. Um, so in that case, you know, my recommendation would be, you got to go barbless. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, you know, volitionally, if it's a safety issue, I, I just pinch cause I don't want to have to worry about it. My buddy just had yeah. to go to the hospital for a shad fly that was stuck in his left love handle. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and if, if I was there, I was going to show him the line technique, you know, oh, yeah, to yeah. pop it out, which is very oh. effective. You, yeah. you know, you put a piece of thick line in the gape of the hook, push down, on the hook, um, basically pushing the, the, you would think you'd be pushing the hook deeper into the meat, right? but you'd make that push and then pull, they just pop right out. You Along know, with your with, kidney. Yeah. <laughs> His kidney. In but, there. um, yeah, he, he had to go to the hospital to get that thing out. You know, they, they tried to cut the hook and then it was a surgery at that point, Ugh. you know, yeah. but I, I love the idea of having more fisheries be barbless because of what you just said safety being mm-hmm. one but you know the protection of these protection of these fisheries that are, are pretty f- fragile in in the last you know 10 years of drought that we just experienced you know that's that's just my thing yeah and, and and that's the kind of information that we want from the questionnaires you know to right. get get that insight on right. um you know because not everybody wants that same you know experience mm-hmm. necessarily they just want to harvest fish and to me there's different fisheries for different folks yeah. um and so that's just another tool in our toolbox enforcement of it's a little squirrely right you know where do you draw the line the cotton ball the yeah. shirt, the shirt. Um, yeah exactly you know um so it, these are all the things that we're struggling with and we'll be you know reaching out for for input on do our, you oh sorry go ahead uh, it doesn't so basically in, in terms of regs being changed or whatever it's still it's kind of not you guys aren't right really there to kind of you're not quite ready yet to voice how that's going to go down. well that's yet. what i was going to say too is the penalties and fines involved with some of these things like are they going to increase or change i mean is that a t- uh 
I mean, that, no, no, that's not part of the simplification. Right. And, and at some point, when that issue I, I, I brought up on the little Truckee, I was at a fly club meeting because our director was there and I was an embedded person just in case he got stuck on, on a question. And, and the issue came up about this $1,200 fine. And I was like, I can't believe that's a, why is the LT a twelve hundred dollar fine? Well, yeah. we have a base fee that goes into any of these uh, code violations. Mm-hmm. On top of that, the local county fish and game commission can add on. Mm-hmm. So, to me, it, you know, from a biological standpoint and and from an enforcement standpoint, that's like three times the the amount of a red red light violation. Right. So, but we as a department don't necessarily control that. So I think it's another thing to consider through this process and work with the county fish and game commissions that we don't abuse that, yeah. you know, and, and let them know that, you know, in the grand scheme of things, biologically at the population level, a violation like that is probably, you know, that doesn't fit the crime. Um, but, you know, that's that's not for us. We set our, our codes straight. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, for most of those in, in, uh, infractions or misdemeanors, they're probably like 100 bucks or 75 yeah. bucks. Yep. Um, I look at like the spring run salmon, you know, that are potentially could go extinct, right. Or just not be, uh, and have in some rivers. And, you know, we have kids and, and anglers of all ages going down there and snagging these salmon, you know, cause they're there, they can see them. They're in a small Creek that, you know, it's very easy to see them. So they go down there and snag a fish and whatever, you know, but I, I would just think that's, and that's what I've talked to Chad about is just the, if the, fine was a little bit more aggressive in a situation for like an that for an anadromous species. fish that again that we're looking at is potential extinction um i don't know that's just a something we've talked about that's a right? that's a great point and yeah. you know and i'm sure in for a lot of enforcement folks if they listen to this will be nodding their head yes but right. again you know you think in the grand scheme of things when these go to court and they go in front of the da mm-hmm. um you've got to have a really good judge that understands what you just explained right and right. so you, you can put into perspective you've got somebody that just created grand theft and they just came in front of somebody who snagged a fish i don't get it <laughs> why am i going to charge him ten thousand dollars you know as a fine right. you know so right they struggle with that with the abalone issue. If you've well, got a really good judge in DA, you can make those kind of my, cases. Yeah, kind of like my thought on that though is, I would craft the the reg not not to win in court because if it's gotten that far, it's you're already in kind of like a, you know, if you look at it a bell curve of litigation, you're already on the tail. And so I'm talking about the middle. You know, most of the people that that will just pay the fine but not have to go to court and fight it. I think that's what you need to build the regulation around, not so much the the fringe, the fringe ones because they're going to be so few and far between that it's not going to really matter in terms of either driving revenue for the fishery or whatever it is. But you know, manage to that that bell bell, bell curve of people that are least likely to reg, to litigate. You know what I mean? And that import- makes sense. It's important, you know. Obviously, you want people buying licenses and getting out and going fishing and, and paying for all this stuff, right? So you got to make it, you know, yeah. attract attracting. Well, do you guys want to talk about the the leader length reg? It's section sh- two point zero five <laughs> leader length regulate restriction. It should be unlawful to use any configuration of fishing tackle in anadromous waters unless the distance between the terminal hook or terminal lure and any weight attached to the line or leader, whether fixed or sliding, is less than six feet. For purpose of this section, weight includes any product used to submerge the line or leader, including non-buoyant artificial flies or artificial lures, but does not include integrated or sinking fly fishing lines, lead core lines used while trolling from a boat, dropper weights used while trolling from a boat, or clipped weights used with downrigger systems. Okay, so... First question. You wrote that, right? Yeah. Okay. So we've got the guy <laughs> that, that wrote this section, you guys. Yeah. So pay close attention. Listeners here. can't see the sweat, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I've got, I. so say Euro Nymphine rig, say 18 foot leader typically, with a, usually you guys fish a point fly, which would be in per these, this reg, um, the weighted, where, where is it, Nick? The weighted, uh, artif- okay, including non buoyant artificial flies or artificial lures. So, a non buoyant artificial fly, I could interpret if I read that as a point fly on a, on a Euro rig, right? So, yep. basically, 
my meat and potatoes fly stone fly with you know x amount of wraps of lead that falls under what you're saying right yep okay includes any product so is my euro rig going to be or is it illegal so under the and this is where it would be nice to have the graphics which we mm-hmm. brought to the commission right so i had to do a little diagram of what this looks mm-hmm. like but for a, a euro nymph system you take your bottom fly which mm-hmm. is your terminal fly which mm-hmm. is your weight and then you would measure the longest distance up your your leader. So in most cases, and I and I talked to a bunch of people, including the fly shop owners, when people are using a Euro rig or even an indicator rig, mm-hmm. how often do you run into a situation where the bottom fly is six feet away from your top weight? Never. Never. It's really rare. So if you're using a Euro rig, usually you're gonna, even if you're running three flies, you're not gonna be six feet from your bottom fly to your top. No. Wait. Okay. I think I understand. If I had crayons and a cocktail napkin, I can show you. <laughs> I can I can give you a cocktails and a whiteboard. <laughs> well, we never leave, but <laughs> so okay. that there has been, you know, sliding weights used and I guess at some point in time while that thing is drifting, it does but it always ends up coming close to you know, right, right to the hook. It right. slides to always to the hook. But I, I, the way it reads, it makes sense. It, it's tough to write something like this that that gets it to the intent of what we we're trying to do sure. to restrict the long leaders sure. and not hit somebody who's trolling with lead core, who's mm-hmm. yep. using a drop way to troll for stripers, a mm-hmm. kid fishing for bluegill. I mean, it just. But it, for the fly, and one of the, I think one of the biggest hindrances in understanding this is that we have leader in the definition. Right. And really, it's not a leader restriction as much as a distance between weight to weight the in, and, in the terminal hook. That's yeah. the key thing. Yeah. So if it's if it's less than six feet, you're fine. You're good. Right? Yep. That's the key thing. So, okay, got it. It is. You know, there's still going to be guys out there in the outlet throwing these snagging rigs. Yep. Is there, is there ever going to be a, a situation or like, are the times going to change a little bit on that? But I think I, you know, it's funny. I bring this up. I just listen to myself talk. Um, people need, those fish need to be harvested, I guess. You know, when you say I, outlet, you're talking thermal the feather. Yeah. Thermal the feather. Yeah. 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 Um, y- you know, there's, it all depends what, you know, how, your perspective on harvest, right. right? And those hatchery right. fish, they're, right. they're there for a reason at some right. level. And I won't even go down yeah. that road, but right. Right. you know, there's going to be a transition from the Nimbus base enclosure to this with this reg. And, and there's going to be a learning period and sure. people are going to have mm-hmm. to, and in reality, they're probably going to find a way to game this system. If sure. you have a congregation of salmon, big salmon in three or four feet of water, this isn't going to stop the problem. <laughs> right. And then, you know, and I, and I, I talked to JD Ritchie and all uh-huh. the guys on the subcommittee. I'm like, let's mm-hmm. not kid ourselves. We're not going to find a silver bullet through regs and science, right. but we can maybe mitigate mm-hmm. and create a speed bump for this. Mm-hmm. Um, Just help educate people a exactly. little bit more. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so uh, it's not perfect. And, and the regs are really difficult to, uh, my gauge on that is let's not penalize people unnecessarily, but yeah. try to find something that's going to make a difference. I'm really looking forward to that. I'm, I'm stoked that you guys are, are doing that. I think it's going to be awesome um, just to simplify it and make it, you know, easier to read and look at it. It's, it's, it's great. And I love that you're bringing the anglers in and talking to guides like that to, to get the information. It's perfect. Yeah, no great. thanks. I'm I'm excited and a little scared. So, yeah. <laughs> what else? Uh, what else do you have for us, Roger? Oh, that was a lot of information. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of things going on. You know, uh, and, and Are, no, any future projects you're excited excited about or. I'm trying to about. I'm trying to stay focused on the the trout renaissance stuff. I'm, mm-hmm. I have a few things I like to do before I retire in this department. Mm-hmm. Fixing and improving the regs is one. Mm-hmm. Creating more opportunities for anglers. I mean, that's I, I want to look back on my career and go, you know, that that made the difference. The challenge awesome. the challenge was one of those things. I you know yeah you know with Ryan and all these other folks that knew nothing about necessarily native trout. So looking out, um, there's some other legacy you know, hopes that I have about mm-hmm. saving and recovering some of our listed trout species and other, um, species, mm-hmm. uh, getting sack perch is another, uh, you know, and a lot of people don't know that's our kind of native sunfish. Mm-hmm. Um, and we'd like to expand those angling opportunities to catch, uh, uh, sack perch. They're in Crowley. Uh, a lot of people fish for them in Crowley. They're in pyramid mm-hmm. too. They're in Almanor. 
They're um, good to eat, right? Yeah, they're super tasty. Uh, great that's fish the, tacos. That's the problem. That's can why you, they're not around. <laughs> can, you get, can you get them like a, like a fish for bass, or is it a completely different thing? You can get them. Uh, they're, they're not huge, but you could get them the same way you fish for bass, maybe with little jigs or something. But a lot of the folks just get them intermittently, um, either through jigs if they target them, or when they're fishing at Crowley or Almanor for trout, and they okay. pick them up. The striper love them. Oh, yeah. And the certain demographic loves them. To his, they're to they're his tasty, baller. which doesn't help, you know, our recovery efforts. But, you know, we're looking for uh, m- more angling opportunity, smart angling opportunity, recovery of native fish. Um, it's all awesome. Yeah, that's uh, protecting, you know, trying to keep the aquatic invasives out. Mm-hmm. That's another ongoing struggle that we face all over the place. If it's not, I don't know if you guys heard about the nutria, you know, the big rat. Um, yeah. It's quagga mussels, New Zealand mud snails. Um, so we're constantly battling and trying to, you know, inform anglers of what not to do. So Well, Chad and I, you know, we're, we're trying to get a lot of resources together here locally in, in Chico and around the North State. And I know there's a lot of other anglers doing the same thing. And so, I mean, let us know whatever you guys need as far as conservation efforts, habitat restoration, like – Shoot us some ideas and for projects and things that you want to see or have or if done. You guys, and, you know, want and, want to get the word out on something. And and we'll yeah. you know, oh, I appreciate that. We we want to be a part of that. We want to help and do do what we can. And I told Chad I've spent a lot most of my life catching these fish. I want to make sure that my my kids get to see those fish and catch them as well. Well, so. the one thing I think next takeaway from here is he's going to start to pinch all of his treble hooks going forward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it saves doctor bills out. Yeah. yeah. Nothing else. Yeah. And, and pet threats. I, I, I tie a lot of flies and I, mm-hmm. I do it at the bench and, uh, oh yeah. It's for my dogs right. more than anything else. I mean, it probably should be thinking about myself and my kids, yeah. but my dogs, I worry cause I got so many bugs dropping sure. in the carpet that, uh, I'm like, I got to pinch these things. <laughs> I don't want to go to the vet. So yeah, yeah, my, my dog likes you. He's been at your feet the entire time. I know. Time. I know. Nice dog. Well, <laughs> um, don't, uh, come up and, and do some fishing with us. You want to throw for some stripers or do some, st- chase some steelhead or something like that. When you find the time and all your madness and, yeah. All the great things you're doing uh, for the state, we really we appreciate it. And yeah, come up and let's do some fishing. Oh, thanks. I enjoy being here and talking with you guys. Awesome. Cool. So the uh, website, everybody, uh, is the wildlife.ca.gov, California Department of Fish and Wildlife. This was Roger Bloom. Yeah, come back and tell us about all this. You know, after we get it, you get it yeah. implemented, we want to hear more. So. Yeah. 2020. <laughs> I hope to see you guys before then at the, no, at the town should. halls. Yeah. There you go. Awesome. Thanks, Roger. All right. Thanks, guys. Key music. This podcast would not be possible without support from our sponsors, Fish Bio and Amped Up Build. Fish Bio is a consulting firm that offers a fresh approach to fishery science. They specialize in fish research, monitoring, and conservation with innovative uses of technology and communication. From their offices in Chico, Oakdale, and Santa Cruz, California, to Vienchen, Laos, Fish Bio is committed to solving natural resource challenges locally and globally. Learn more at www.fishbio.com. And Amp.Build. Amp is a software design and engineering shop located in Chico, California. Amp creates beautiful apps for mobile and desktop devices, wearables, and the Internet of Things. Amp develops native, web, and hybrid apps on a variety of platforms. Chad, who co-hosts this podcast, is the agency's founder. Learn more at www.amp.Build.